अर्जुन वाच एवं सततयुक्ताये भक्तस्वं परिभाषते यच्चाक्षरम व्यक्तं चेशं के योगवीतमह अर्जुन इंक्वायर्ड व्हिच आर कंसीडर्ड टू बी मोर परफेक्ट दोस हु ऑलवेज प्रॉपर्ली एंगेज्ड इन योर डिवोशनल सर्विस और दोस हु वर्शिप द इनपर्सनल ब्रह्मन द अनमैनिफेस्टेड Prabhupada comments, Krishna has now explained about the personal, the impersonal and the universal and has described all kinds of devotees and yogis. Generally, the transcendentalist can be divided into two classes. One is the impersonalist and the other is the personalist. Um. And then at the end of his commentary he writes, Now Arjuna is trying to settle the question of which process is easier and which of the classes is most perfect. In other words, he is clarifying his own position because he is attached to the personal form of Krishna. He is not attached to the impersonal Brahman. He wants to know whether his position is secure. the impersonal manifestation either in this material world or in the spiritual world of the supreme lord is a problem for meditation actually one cannot perfectly conceive of the impersonal feature of the absolute truth therefore arjuna wants to say what is the use of such a waste of time arjuna experienced in the 11th chapter that to be attached to the impersonal form of krishna is best but because he could thus understand all other forms and at the same time there was no disturbance uh I'm sorry I lost where I was reading there was no disturbance to his love for Krishna this is important this important question asked of Krishna by Arjuna will clarify the distinction between the impersonal and personal conceptions of the absolute truth So we see here that Arjun wants to clarify these two different paths, and uh, we see that in the previous chapters, in chapter two, chapter four, five, and chapter six, Krishna was stressing uh, the process or the path of knowledge. and of course he was stressing nishkam karma yoga but he, he distressed that that brings one to knowledge the path, the path of gyan and also even when he began the discussion uh, of bhakti there was also some uh, verses and some sections like in chapter 8 when he was describing yoga mishra bhakti that some will uh take that path and he described the two paths uh of uh devayana and pitriyana and then even in in even in chapter 9 he described gyana yagyena chapyanye yajanto mam upasate that those who worship me with gyana yagya right and so and that gyan yagya was also mentioned in chapter 4 from text 24 and onwards on the list of yagyas so uh throughout the the bhagavad gita uh krishna has mentioned this uh impersonal path path of gyana so and especially in the last chapter Arjuna saw that uh the universal form of the Lord and the mighty power and opulence and horror of the form and although the universal form is not an impersonal form but still it's not a sweet loving form like the form that he is accustomed to with two arms the the form that he's attached to and the the form of shama sunda that he's heard the ananya bhaktas worship and always hear and chant about 
Uh, so he's heard about that, and he said, "Evam sat satata yukta ye," because he heard "Tesham satata yukta nam," in ten ten. That those devotees, the Nanya Bhaktas, they worship me in such a way. And a description of that was also given just in the last verse of chapter 11, Mat Kama Krin Mat Paramo. Uh, and then such a person who does this, my Nanya Bhaktas, then he comes to me. So, he's describing that first path there in the first half of the verse. And then he says, ye chap yaksharam avyaktam. There's also this other path of the avyaksha, uh, or akshara, the indestructible form of God. Of course, Krishna is also av, uh, akshara, but here avyakta. So he refers to the akshara brahma, or the impersonal brahman, the nirvishesh uh, aspect of the, of the absolute truth. So therefore he wants to know, he's divided these two paths. And he says, Tesham, of them, Ke, who is Yoga Vitta Maha? Who is uh, the best of these persons? Who is the best among all the types of who worship you? So Yoga Vitara would be someone who is... Uh, better, but yoga vittama means the topmost. So this is similar to, he'll use this word again, yuktattama, yuktattama, who is most highly perfected. What is That's the perfect path of yoga, yoga. So here it's kind of similar, yoga vittama. Balade Vidyabhushan, uh, gives a certain slant on this. Uh, basically says one path is knowing that the living entity as the Lord's part and parcel and meditating on the Lord by hearing and chanting. That is the Ananya Bhakti path. Meditating on the Lord. And the second path is that of one meditates on Brahman. But he says here, and he oh he quotes the verse Avinashi to Tadvidi from chapter two seventeen. And after hearing these different paths, Arjuna asks this question: the first worship is Shamasundar, and the second is the Akshara, the indestructible. But he says this is the sense of this second path. Some say that well, this is the sense of this question. Some say that because meditation on Krishna is firmly rooted or is firmly fixed when it is preceded by direct experience of one's own soul, one can attain him without any obstacles. Right? So that is the impersonal path. In other words, the meditation on the akshara, which would mean the soul, individual soul. Because he says, some people say, because meditation on Krishna is firmly fixed. When, when before one worships Krishna, one gets direct experience of one's own soul. So in this way, one's path of bhakti can proceed without any obstructions. And the others say, because it's so difficult to meditate on the formless, subtle soul the individual soul. So what is the use of such meditation? Like Prabhupada quoted Arjuna saying, what is the use of su such waste of time? So devotional service alone is the destroyer of all obstacles and the cause of attaining Krishna. Right? So that would be considered the higher path. The, the path that Prabhupada pointed out that Arjuna was saying, what is the use of this waste of time meditating on the soul? the akshara, because the soul is also called akshara, individual soul. So that's his presentation on this verse. And uh, that's uh, understandable. We see that Prabhupada also gives some credence to this in his commentary. 
I believe, in the next commentary. And Prabhupada also kind of gives us uh, a, a glance back at the rest of the Gita in his commentary also. And he's, um, he's giving evidence that bhakti has always been supported throughout the, that's been the conclusion, that uh, the path of bhakti, ananya bhakti, and the form of worshipping Krishna's personal form is the best. Uh, he says, I think it's in the fourth paragraph, in the second chapter of the Gita, the Lord explained that a living entity is not material body, he's not the material body, he's a spirit spark. And the absolute truth is the spirit whole. In the seventh chapter, he spoke of the living entity as being part and parcel of the supreme whole, and he re recommended that he transfer his attention fully to the whole. Then again, in the eighth chapter, it was said that anyone who thinks of Krishna at the time of quitting his body is at once transferred to the spiritual sky, in the of Krishna. And he, at the end of the sixth chapter, the Lord clearly said, that of all yogis, one who always thinks of Krishna within is considered the most perfect. So in practically every chapter, the conclusion has been that one should be attached to the personal form of Krishna, for that is the highest spiritual realization. Okay, so now, um, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur comments that when the subject of bhakti was introduced, Arjuna heard that those with Shraddha, who are Shraddhavan, and who worship the Lord with devotion, Bajateya Mam, right? That uh, the worship the Lord with devotion are the best of yogis. That is the Lord's opinion. Arjuna heard about the supremacy of devotees in such introductory statements, and he now desires to hear more about that supremacy. So, as Prabhupada pointed out, he, throughout the Gita, he's heard about this uh, supremacy of bhakti. Uh, so, those with faith who worship me, that they are the highest. And in chapter 9, he heard such a beautiful uh, explanation by Krishna, how that Krishna loves that person so much, he's so dear to him that he is a friend, is in me, and I am a friend to him. Even though I'm usually partial to everybody, or impartial to everyone, I'm partial to him. And then even if he commits some horrible sin, still I overlook that, and I still accept him in my heart. And all people can do this. The path of bhakti is so powerful, even those who are of the lowest birth. And then what to speak of you, Arjuna, so you please worship me by fixing your mind on me and you become my devotee. In this way, he was speaking very sweetly. And then further, Krishna continued and described uh, how even the rishis and the devas, they don't understand me. It's such a secret beyond the highest people of the universe, but I'm giving this knowledge to you, Arjuna. And then he spoke the Chatur Shloki. And, and he's describing how I am the source of everything and my devotees, they're addicted to hearing about me just like they can't stop eating like a fish can't live without, out of the water they always, and they're always helping one another on the path of devotion and they enjoy great bliss uh, doing this and I give them my very uh, direct uh, association in their heart. I enter into, into their heart like a bumblebee enters into the lotus and I inspire their love for me. And in such a way, and then Arjuna was very, very uh, enlivened. Uh, so, but then, you know, he somehow, <laughs> you know, Krishna tricked him when I ran, and, and, and Arjuna said, yeah, I'd like to see that form. <laughs> and then the whole universal form was manifest. And then all, you know, then he was like crying and afraid, and he was shivering, and, and he fell on the ground, and he lost vision of his Krishna, his dear friend, and he was trembling. And he said, oh, I don't want to see this anymore. <laughs> it's too much. I want to see your sweet form again. And then Krishna said, yes. And he said, 
It's so rare to see this form that one cannot achieve it by doing the usual practices of given in the Vedas. And, and now I will show you the form that you see, that you want to see the usual form you see me in my sweet form. And this form is even more difficult as Su Durdarsham. And only by bhakti can one actually understand me in such a way. So Krishna, you know, it's like Arjuna heard this, <laughs> his, his heart's been tossed back and forth, you know, and his mind is also, his intelligence has been tossed back and forth by hearing these two paths throughout the whole Gita. And so now, like at the end, like we said, Krishna was like sh actually summarizing his whole teachings, just in, <coughs> in Mat, Mat Karma Krin Mat Paramal. That was really supposed to be it. But now Arjuna is like thinking about all these things, how sweet it was to hear about bhakti and about Krishna, how he loves his devotee and how his devotees love him and, and how the relationship is developed in such a nice way. And then he, and he thought, yeah, I'm attracted to Krishna in such a way. But then there's this other path of uh, akshara, uh, nirvishesh brahman, those who are jnanis. And Krishna said that some worship him in such a way, and that, that is also, you know, uh, they're also detached and peaceful and so forth. So he, he's like tossed this in his mind throughout the Gita, and he just wants to finally get the last word, because he knows that I don't like that other path, that I like this, this path of bhakti, where I worship Krishna directly. So is that okay, Krishna? Is that, or, should, or is there a better path? Actually, which of these paths is the best and the easiest and quickest way to achieve you? So that is his mentality. So he wanted to clarify his own position, as Prabhupada wrote, because he, you know, he's attached to Krishna, not to the Brahman. He wanted to hear more about bhakti, and the loving relationship between Krishna and his devotee. And he wanted to make sure that no one would be confused that the Vishra Rup was is like the highest form, supreme aspect of the absolute truth. So those who are properly engaged in devotional service was just mentioned in the last verse, as he mentions that. Those who are always properly engaged in your devotional service, as in Mat Kama Krin Mat Parama, or those who worship the impersonal Brahman, Akshara. Or as Baladev Vidyabhushan points out, that they feel it's necessary in, in order to uh, proceed uh, nicely on the path of bhakti, that one should realize one's own soul first. So one should meditate on the akshara jiva, uh, Brahm, you know, this Brahma. Not para Brahman, but the Brahman, the spirit soul. Okay, next verse. So Krishna answers. Yeah. Shri Bhagavan Vacha Maya Veshamanu Yemam Nitya Yukta Upasate Shadhaya Paryo Petas Teme Yukta Tamamataha The Supreme Personality of God had said, Those who fix their minds on my personal form and are always engaged in worshipping me with great and transcendental faith are considered by me to be most perfect. So, a very clear answer is given now. And uh, this yuktatama is given, that those who are highest, most perfect in yoga, right, they're considered to be t by me to be most perfect. So, compared to the Nanya Bhaktas, the Mishra Bhaktas are Yoga Vitara, but they're not Yoga Vittama. So, therefore, bhakti is greater than jnana, and within bhakti, ananya bhakti is supreme. Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur says, this has been established here in this verse. The, the Mishra bhaktas are yoga vitara, but not yoga vitama. And he says, 
Thus, bhakti is greater than jnana, but within bhakti, the ananya, ananya bhakti is supreme. And uh, I think this is some cool shape. He also quotes, Vishnu Chakravarti quotes from the Bhagavatam in his commentary, Canto 11, Chapter 25, Text 27. And there the verse basically describes faith in goodness, passion and ignorance and in nirgun. 11, 25, 27. That faith in ignorance brings a dharma. Faith in passion brings attachment to the fruits of work. And faith in goodness is related to the soul. Understanding I'm not this body. But nirgun faith, that's devotional service. So he describes this nitya yukta here in such a way, describing different kinds of sadhakas. And he uses this verse from the Bhagavatam to describe this. Well, can someone bring the fourth canto, uh, part two again? So Prabhupada comments now, Please listen. Prabhupada writes, In answer to Arjuna's question, Krishna clearly says that he who concentrates upon his personal form and who worships him with faith and devotion is to be considered most perfect in yoga. For one in such Krishna consciousness, there are no material activities because everything is done for Krishna. A pure devotee is constantly engaged. Sometimes he chants, Sometimes he hears or reads books about Krishna. Sometimes he cooks prasadam or goes to the marketplace to purchase something for Krishna. Or sometimes he washes the temple or the dishes. Whatever he does, he does not let a single moment pass without devotion, devoting his activities to Krishna. Such action is in full samadhi. It's a very practical description of devotee. Uh, so uh, Arjuna became happy to hear the su about the superiority of bhakti. But he was also wondered, what about the others? What, is, what happens to them? What's their result? So Krishna uh, describes that in the next two verses. Hitvaksharam nirdesham avyaktam paryupasate sarvadragam achintyam cha kutastam achalam dhruvam sanniyam yendriya gramam sarvatra sammabhudhayaha te prapna vanti maam eva sarvabhuta hite rataha. But those who fully worship the unmanifested, that which that which lies beyond the perception of the senses, the all-pervading, inconceivable, unchanging, fixed and immovable, the impersonal conception of the absolute truth, by controlling the various senses and being equally disposed to everyone, such persons engage in the welfare of all, at last achieve me. So, the verse 3 in verse 3, Krishna defines akshara with the following terms. Anir desha avyaktam sarvatragam achintyam kutastam achalam and dhruvam. So it's quite a description. That's why the translation is very long. And uh, anyway, the, the, the meanings are given there and in the translation and in the synonyms. So, like in uh, anir desham is indefinite, cannot be defined. Right, avyaktam, unmanifested, and sarvatragam is all pervading. Achintyam, inconceivable. Kutastam, unchanging. 
achalam, immovable, and dhruva means fixed. So, so then in the next verse, uh, and uh, to, to give some credence to Baladi Vidyabhushan's perception, it seems that Prabhupada says in the second paragraph of his commentary, in order to perceive the super-soul within the individual soul, one has to cease the sensual activities of seeing, hearing, tasting, working, etc. Then one comes to understand that the Supreme Soul is present everywhere. Realizing this, no one envies no living entity. So, anyway, he does mention the individual soul. Uh, he's talking about the Paramatma there. So, but somehow it seemed that there was some connection. Now in the second verse, um, in the second verse, Krishna then states the method of worship of that Akshara. <coughs> That's the verse beginning, Sani Yam Yendriya Gramam. So that's how, that is the Abhideya for achieving. This is what these type of persons do. They control the senses and they're mm, equally disposed to everyone. Their intelligence is equipoised and they, he says, Sarabhutahiterataha, they work for the welfare of all. And the, their mentality is, may there be good fortune for all, Baladeva Dibhushan says. May there be good fortune for everyone. So that's the things that they do, mainly sense control being balanced and being helpful to everyone, seeing that everyone's equal on the spiritual platform. So the devotees also have these characteristics. And he says, Mam Eva, te prapnu vanti Mam Eva, that they also achieve me. And Vishnu Chak Chakravarti Thakur says, in other words, there's no difference between that Akshara Brahma and me. Of course, Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur is not saying the Akshara Brahma is the individual spirit soul. So he says it's uh, the impersonal absolute. So you can say that Mam Eva has these two meanings. One is that Krishna is saying that he achieves the Akshara Brahma, however you define it, <laughs> uh, which is non different from me. So, like he said, Brahmano hi Pradishtaham, right, that, that Brahman is, I'm the foundation of that. So, if they achieve Brahman, then they also achieve me, because I'm non different. Brahmati, Paramatmati, Bhagavaniti, Shabite. There's no difference between these, they're just three different aspects of the Absolute Truth. So one can see it like that. And then Prabhupada gives a different way. And he quoting this uh, uh, Vasudevam Sarvam Iti, right? That the Mahonam Janmanam Ante Gyanama Mam Prapadite that after many, many births, those people who are on that path of jnana, they do it. finally, or gradually, ultimately, they do realize Vasudev Sarvamiti. But it takes some time. It takes births, many births. So that's two ways of looking at this, Mam Eva. Let's finish that up to this. The end. The f this section is from uh, one to seven. Right. Oh, I got too many things here. Let's let's go to seven first. Otherwise, we'll lose the flow. 
I need another table or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Too many books. Yeah, anyway, there's different... Uh, this is called bhakti over, or maybe you can say superior to impersonalism from one to seven. Let's see what he calls it here. The names of the sections changed every one or two years. <laughs> Bhakti is superior to impersonalism, that's better. Yeah. Can you hold this for a second? So I don't have so many books. And also hold this. Okay. Okay. Uh yes. All right. So one might question and I think it's mentioned that Arjuna he asked this. How then are the Ganis inferior? If they also achieve you, you said that that the path of bhakti is better, but you said that those those who are worshiping the impersonal Brahman, they they also achieve you. So what makes the, that path any you know lower, inferior? So that verse, this verse answers that question. <coughs> Klesho di karataras ti sham avyakta sakta cheta sam avyakta hi gatir dukam nehavadir. For those whose minds are attached to the unmanifested and personal feature of the Supreme, advancement is very troublesome. To make progress in that discipline is always difficult for those who are embodied. Can you bring the second canto also? Thanks. So, the personal path is superior. Why? Because the faults of the impersonal path are now given. That it's troublesome. Klesha. So then, we should ask, why is it troublesome? What do you think? We will write your answers on the board. What are what are the different reasons why this why this path is troublesome? Klesha, Adikara. Right. Can somebody write these things? Ramananda? Let's make a list. To conceive of the to conceive of the impersonal nature. Yes. Right. Relying on your own ability, which means intelligence, determination, sense control, right? Own ability. Yeah, something else? Many austerities without any taste. Okay, thank you. Good. Someone else? Yes. What's that? It's without. Without personal reciprocation. Are you sure about that? Uh, the Ganis, they ever have a dream that the Brahman comes to them, <laughs> says, yes, you are going on the right path, do not worry. I am waiting for you to merge into me. <laughs> oh, you never heard of any such dream, Lena? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Continue with your dry austerities. <laughs> yes, you will come to me. <laughs> You'll merge into me very soon. <laughs> yeah, there's no reciprocation. Yes, more. Entity wants to work. He has work. What? Who? Work. Who wants to work? Nobody wants to work. I never met anyone who wants to work. Yeah. 
<laughs> okay, you're saying that in ge I think your point is more like the living entity is active by nature, right? And for him to just sit down and just to think about the Supreme, it's not so easy. Yeah. Scope for dovetailing his activities. Okay, so it's difficult to be inactive. And, uh, okay, now you, you don't have to give the reasons why the bhakti path is better, but just give the re negative reasons why it's more. So the, it's difficult to be inactive. Let's just put it that way. What else? Mm-hmm. But why, you, why would want the impersonalists want to do that? Oh, if they realize later, then, right. That's actually mentioned in the commentaries, that there's very deep samskars of this nirvishesh brahman in the minds of those jnanis, that if later they do come to the path, it's very difficult for them to actually get rid of those samskars. And uh, that's confirmed in the Chaitanya Charitamrita by the story of Sarvagya, the astrologer, when he was giving the story uh, about the the man who whose father had passed away and left him a, a treasure, great treasure. And he said, "In the if you dig to the too far to the west, you'll be attacked by ghosts." And he was referring to this. You know, there's some scars of Nivishesh Brahman, uh, you know, meditation. Those are the ghosts that attack you. When you try to give them up, it's not so easy. Uh, yes? Yes. The impersonal Brahman has no lotus feet <laughs> to take shelter on. <laughs> Uh, there's no, uh, why did you say no shelter? Yeah, there's no shelter for the heart. We never see any prayers to, from the jnanis to the impersonal Brahman in any shastra, right? If there's any prayers, it's like, please remove the effulgence so that I can see your form of bliss, or something like that. <laughs> we don't see any prayers. We don't see that there's, there's any shelter for the heart. You can't pray to a white light, you know. You can't cry. And, you know, devotees, they can cry, and they should cry for Krishna, and, and beg for his shelter, but it's impossible to do that with the Nirvishesh Brahman. There's no shelter for the heart. So actually if you divide this up, you'll see that it comes into three categories, the body, the mind, and the heart, or the soul, you could say. So for the body, there's a lot of dry austerities. For the mind, you have these impersonal conceptions which are d difficult to grasp. And then for the heart, there's no shelter. There's no one to pray to. There's no, there's no one to depend on when you have trouble. And, and plus, there's no reciprocation on the personal level. Isn't it? Own ability would be Maybe a combination of body and mind, I guess. Uh, and active, that's the body, uh, body also, right? The body is active. Of course, the mind's also active. But. Right, so Prabhupada mentioned some of these in his commentary. Uh. He says they have to understand the unmanifested representation of the Supreme through the Vedas like the Upanishads and learn the language, understand the non-perceptual feelings and realize all these. It's not e very easy for a common man. And then he says, but the devotee 
uh, he can offer his obeisances to the deity, hear the glories of the Lord, just take prasadam, and realize God <laughs> in such easy way. So, the, you know, the impersonalists, they don't have any deity to worship, any garlands to smell, incense, or any oils and flowers, right, to offer, because they don't offer them to anyone. There's no clothes or any, you know, shringar. There's no kirtan, and there's no prasadam. You can imagine trying to do this process without prasadam, without kirtan, without Krishna's pastimes, without the deity. Boy, you really dry up. You know, you'd probably jump out the window after a week. <laughs> we could just tell you, you just sit in this room, we'll lock all the doors, and you just meditate on the supreme absolute truth. And you can't chant japa, you can't read any books, you can't go in the temple room, and no prasadam. <laughs> we'll just leave you like a pot, a pot of boiled rice, you know, by the door, and like this. This is like you know really difficult process, <laughs> and you just okay. You can study some of the Upanishads. We'll put them in the room. <laughs> but your main process is to meditate on Parabrahman. Right? And that's why, I mean, later we'll, we'll talk about this again, but Prabhupada said, work now, samadhi later. It's very hard to be inactive for the body or the mind. And to, be, and to feel yourself all alone without a friend that cares for you, that, you know, that God his doesn't really love you. It's just you're part of Him and you just haven't realized it yet. And it's not a Him, it's a It. You know what I mean? <laughs> and you're just going to merge into this light and just float there. And there's no prema, there's no relationships, there's no activities, there's no pastimes, there's no beautiful Vrindavan scenery. Just floating in the vast part of Yom eternally. Right? It's really <laughs> frightening, right? <laughs> I made a note here. I don't know really what, I didn't really look at it, but usually when I make the notes, I know, it's something to do with the verse. <laughs> so here it says that the pantheist worship, uh, is worshiping Visharup and the, mon the monist is worshiping the indescribable subtle form. It must be in the commentary. Let's me, let me read this. Neither of the above forms of the Lord, as just described unto you from the material angle of vision, is accepted by the pure devotees of the Lord who know him well. Okay. Prophet's commentary. The impersonalists think of the absolute personality of Godhead in two different ways, as above mentioned. On the one hand, they worship the Lord in his visharup, or the all-pervading universal form. And on the other, they think of the Lord's unmanifested, indescribable, subtle form. The theories of pantheism and monism are respectively applicable to these two conceptions of the Supreme as gross and subtle. But both of them are rejected by the learned pure devotees of the Lord because they are aware of the factual position. This is mentioned in the 11th chapter, Adishtapurvam Rishitosmi Drishpa. This verse. Arjuna, as a pure devotee of the Lord, never previously saw the contemplated universal form, but when he did see it, his curiosities were satisfied. But he was not happy to see such a form because of his attachment as a pure devotee. He was afraid to see the gigantic form of the Lord and therefore prayed to the Lord to assume his four-handed Narayan or Krishna form, which alone could please Arjuna. 
Undoubtedly, the Lord has the supreme potency to exhibit himself in multifarious forms. But the pure devotees of the Lord are interested in his forms as eternally exhibit, exhibited in the abode of the Lord, known as Tripad Vibhuti, or Kingdom of God. The Lord in the Tripad Vibhuti abode exhibits himself in two forms, either with the four hands or with two hands. The Visharup exhibited in the material manifestation has unlimited hands and unlimited dimensions with everything unlimited. The pure devotees of the Lord worship him in his Vaikuntha forms as Narayan or Krishna. Sometimes the same Vaikuntha forms of the Lord are in the material world also by his grace as Sri Ram, Sri Krishna, Sri Narasimhadev, etc. And thus the pure devotees also worship them. Usually the features shown in the material world have no existence in the Vaikuntha planets and thus they are not accepted by the pure devotees. While the pure devotees worship from the very beginning, well, what the pure devotees worship from the very beginning are eternal forms of the Lord existing in the Vaikuntha planets. The non devotees and impersonalists imagine that the material forms of the Lord and ultimately they merge in the impersonal Brahma Jyoti of the Lord. Whereas the pure devotees of the Lord are worshippers of the Lord both in the beginning and also in the perfect stage of salvation eternally. The worship of the pure devotee never stops, whereas the worship of the impersonalist stops after his attainment of salvation, when he merges in the impersonal form of the Lord, known as Brahma Jyoti. Therefore, the pure devotees of the Lord are described here as vipaschit, or learned, who are, or, or the learned who are in knowledge of the Lord perfectly. <coughs> So anyway, b before this verse, there was a description of the Virat Rup, and then there was something mentioned also that there is this finest form. It has no beginning, no middle, no end. It's beyond the limits of expression <coughs> or mental speculation, and is distinct from the material conception. That's described. This is 2.10.35. <coughs> and that verse again says neither of the above forms <coughs> of the Lord as just described unto you from the material angle of vision is accepted by <coughs> the pure devotees of the Lord who know him well Thank you. Uh, so that does uh, substantiate this idea uh, about the in person, the that the Visharup is uh, kind of leaning. It's an impersonal form. It's kind of categorized as the impersonal because it's in this gross manifestation. It's it's also a temporary form, and it's Prabhupada calls it pantheism. God is everywhere, and so therefore he's nowhere, in a sense because they don't have ultimately a personal conception. So they just see, see the Lord kind of spread everywhere. So two kinds of impersonalists. And this would also substantiate what you were mentioning about Jnana Yagya with the Visharup persons and uh, perhaps the Panchopasanas, which we haven't really seen yet, but that's... Uh, because the first one in that 915 describes the person who is an obvious impersonalist. He thinks, I am the Supreme, I'm Gopal. And the other two are kind of impersonal or, or just grossly impersonal like that. So they can be seen in this way. Actually, impersonalism can practically infiltrate any uh, religious process we, we've seen. Even people who are chanting the holy name and worshiping the deity Gopal, they can have an impersonal conception. So that can, impersonalism can seep into any and all of the practices of religion. So, um, so here we have the, uh, uh, maybe not a full list, but many of the major problems with the impersonal path, why it's troublesome. 
<coughs> Vishwana Chakravarti Thakur is quoting some verses and he says that the, the impersonalist may, must face the crocodile in the ocean of Gyanamarg which is more or less describing that he has to struggle with the crocodile of the six senses or the five senses and the mind in this ocean of Gyana Marg. Oh yeah, so that's why I had the fourth canto. I think that was my cue there. Too many papers floating around here. 422 422.39 we're looking at now somebody has a letter they left in the book oh here we go I found it the devotees oh the, I think you know this verse yatara pankaja palashivilasa bhatya karma shayam gratitam udgratat yanti santa Tadvanna Rikta Matayo Yatayo Pirudha Shroto Ganastam Aranam Bajavasudevam. Right? Famous verse. Though the devotees who are always engaged in the service of the toes of the lotus feet of, of the Lord can very easily overcome hard knotted desires for fruitive activities. Because this is very difficult, the non-devotees, jnanis and yogis, although trying to stop the waves of sense gratification, cannot do so. Therefore, you are advised to engage in the devotional service of Krishna, the son of Vasudev. Like waves of a, the river. Prabhupada writes, There are three kinds of transcendentalists trying to overcome the influence of the modes. Jnanis, yogis, and bhaktis. All of them attempt to overcome the influence of the senses, which is compared to the insistent, incessant waves of a river. The waves of a river flow incessantly, and it is very difficult to stop them. Similarly, the waves of the desire for material enjoyment are so strong that they cannot be stopped by any process other than bhakti yoga. The bhaktas, by their transcendental devotional service unto the lotus feet of the Lord, become so overwhelmed with transcendental bliss that automatically their desires for material enjoyment stop. The jnanis and yogis who are not attached to the lotus feet of the Lord simply struggle against the waves of desire. Okay. I know that theme is th spread throughout Prabhupada's commentary. But the next verse says, the ocean of nescience is very difficult to cross because it is infested with many dangerous sharks or crocodiles, you could say. Although those who are non-devotees undergo severe austerities and penance to cross that ocean, we recommend that you simply take shelter of the lotus feet of the Lord, which are like boats for crossing the ocean. Although the ocean is difficult to cross, by taking shelter of his lotus feet, you will overcome all dangers. So, this is the Kumaras speaking to Prithumara. Yeah. So, they know all about the path of Jnana, <laughs> Mark. <laughs> They're the experts of that path. And they are recommending to someone. So, they must know because they've already tried it. The word nakram means sharks in this verse. So, the impersonalist must face the crocodiles or the sharks of the six senses in the, the ocean of Gyanamarg. And Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur says in his commentary, even if the destination of Nirvishesh Brahma is achieved after much trouble, it happens only with the help of bhakti. Without bhakti to the Lord, he not only undergoes misery, but he also fails to achieve Brahma. You know, just like someone who's beating the shaft of rice, which has already been, you know, husk, just the empty husk, right? This is, and he quotes this verse from the 10th canto, chapter 14 of Lord Brahma. This famous verse. You know this? 
Yeah, Shaya Shitim Bhakti, Udasi Tevi Bhav. Yeah. The rest of it is Te Sham Asau Kleshala, Eva Shishite, right? The word Kleshala. Nanyat Yata Stula Tusha Vigatinam. So just beating that em empty shaft of rice. That is the, what is the use of doing that? Just the trouble that they take. So, Mishnah Chakravati Thakur quotes this verse. So only get the trouble but without any result. They go through, imagine, they go through all this austerity and then they don't even get Brahma because they, they don't do, there's no little tinge of bhakti in their practice. There has to be a little bhakti there because only by the mercy of Bhakti Devi can these jnanis go to Brahma Jyoti. That's why Krishna put the middle six chapters in the middle, right? The chapters about bhakti, so that those who are on the path of jnana, they have some touch between chapter 12 and 13. Right? It's touching there, so they can get some bhakti mixed into their path. So then uh, Balade Vidyabhushan asks, so the, bhak the bhaktas, they have no klesha? Really completely free from any miseries? And he says, no, they also must control the senses and engage in devotional activities, but they always feel my presence, and thus they don't feel the klesha. So devotees also have to control their senses, it's not easy. But because they have the shelter of the lotus feet of the Lord, their heart is satisfied, their mind is satisfied by meditating on the form of the Lord and the leelas of the Lord and engaging in the beautiful activities of devotion which are pleasing to the bodily senses as well. Singing, dancing, taking prasada, smelling the garland, the incense, the oils and the flowers, seeing the beautiful form of the Lord. It's very pleasing to the senses. 10.14.4 Prabhupada writes, I'm just kind of uh, glancing at the page. But. A living entity is eternally an individual soul. And if he wants to merge into the spirit whole, spiritual whole, he may accomplish the realization of the eternal and knowledgeable aspects of his original nature. But the blissful portion is not realized. By the grace of some devotee, such a transcendentalist, highly learned, in Jnana Yoga, may come to the point of bhakti. At that time, long practice in impersonalism also becomes a source of trouble, as we mentioned, because he cannot give up these samskars. Therefore, it is always, the embodied soul is always in difficulty with the unmanifest, both at the time of practice and the time of realization. Right, so when they come, finally come to Vasudev, uh, Savam E.T. Then they have to deal with these ghosts which are like haunting them. The impersonal samskars. So we can see there's a really diff a lot of trouble there. And Baladev Vidyapushan, from his angle of vision, he says, but those who first worship their own imperishable conscious soul have excessively greater difficulty. This is the connection between the verses, between three and four, and two and three, and four or five, etc. Well, he, he, he uh, puts three, four, and five together in one package. So he says this, this point uh, connects verses one and two, or verse two with three and four and five. Because he was saying that uh, <clears throat> the, this Akshara Brahma is the person who first worships his own soul or meditates on his own soul as the imperishable Brahman, Akshara Brahman. So they have excessively greater difficulty than the devotees. Okay, next verses. 
येचु सर्वाणि कर्माणि मयि सन्यस्य मत्परः अनन्यनैव योगेन मां जयन्त उपासते तेषाम् अहं सुमधाता मृत्यु संसार सागरात् भवामि न चिरापार्थ but those who worship me, giving up all their activities unto me, and being devoted to me without deviation, engage in devotional service and always meditating upon me, having fixed their minds upon me, O son of Prita, for them I am the swift deliverer from the ocean of birth and death. So, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur has said that I quickly uplift such a person Whatever is obtained by karma and gyan is easily and quickly attained by my devotee. Someone might ask, how do they cross over this material world? His, he answers, they don't even think of crossing. Thus I personally uplift them without their desiring. And another way he said to answer it is that this question is irre irrelevant because I personally deliver them even if they do not perform any sadhana. It's understood from this that the Lord only exhibits his vatsalya bhav to his bhaktas and not to the jnanis. That's a very merciful statement, isn't it? We don't do any sadhana. <laughs> But that it doesn't mean that they, that it doesn't mean that they don't do anything. They're, they're always hearing and chanting about Krishna. They're hearing his pastimes. It's not like a hard practice, you know. They're hearing his leelas and so forth. So you can see a lot of, you know, like the words of this verse. You can understand it even while you're reading the Sanskrit, right? Ye tu sarvani karmani mai sanyasya matpara. They're giving up all of their activities unto me, mai, matpara, and right in 261, that was the first drop of bhakti, and again he's mentioning it here, right, those who have taken shelter of me, being attached to me, ananya naiva yogina, through ananya bhakti yoga, mam jayanta upasate, and the constantly meditating on, on me. That is their bhajan. That's how they worship me. So for those people, right? So that's the qualifications. For those ananya bhaktis, tesha maham sumardhartha, that for them I am the swift deliverer. Mityu samsara sagarat, from the ocean of birth and death. Bhavami na chira partha says, not after a long time, but very quickly. Maya veshita chaitasam, for those whose minds are fixed on me. So, Baladeva Dibhushan comments, and probably heard that in Gita Amrita, because this is just part from what that I, that I read from the commentaries. Those who, are prop those who properly understand that, they my, that there are my parts and parcels and make no other endeavor to elevate themselves other than pure devotional service to my lotus feet, I personally come for those people. Such pure bhaktas renounce all obstacles to my devotion, like attachment to the duties of varna and ashram. They only hear and remember me and thus worship me in pure devotional service. In this mood, they hear, chant, and meditate on my pastimes, their minds engage in me. Such devotees I uplift from the ocean of material world, and I do it quickly without delay, <coughs> for I cannot tolerate delay. I come on Garuda, pick them up, and mount them on this bird, and personally take them away. Others take the path of light or dark, but I do not care for this process for my pure devotees. And this pure devotional service doesn't depend on prescribed duties or anything else in Varnashram. Devotees by nothing more than devotion and chanting attain me. That's what it means by no sadhana. <laughs> Only by chanting and by hearing about Krishna and devotion. 
So Prabhupada quotes the same verses that Baladevidya Bhushan quotes in his Tika, in the Gita Bhushan. Prabhupada writes in his commentary, The purport of this verse is that a devotee does not need to practice the Shlanga Yoga in order to transfer his soul to the spiritual planets. The responsibility is taken by the Supreme Lord himself. He clearly states here that he himself becomes the deliverer. A child is completely cared for by his parents and thus his position is secure. Similarly, a devotee does not need to endeavor to transfer himself by yoga practice to other planets. Rather, the Supreme Lord, by his great mercy, comes at once riding on his bird carrier, Garuda, and at once delivers the devotee from material existence. Although a man who has fallen in the ocean may struggle very hard and may be very expert in swimming, he cannot save himself. But if someone comes and picks him up from the water, then he is easily rescued. Similarly, the Lord picks up the devotee from this material existence. One simply has to practice the easy process of Krishna consciousness and fully engage himself in devotional service. Such a beautiful verse. And uh, these verses well, the, from the Varaha Purana and the Naraniya, the, the, Naraya, the Narayaniya, Oh, anyway, there was one more verse, but has this word Garuda Skandam Aropya. And he said, I put them on the shoulders of Garuda. Garuda Skanda Aropya Yatitcham Anivartita. I don't want them uh, to go to, to any other practice. I think that's the meaning here. And uh, it says, Archir Adi Gatim Bina. Without the path uh, of Archie, etc. Remember we described that in the eighth chapter? Right? The path of Archie, which is begins the Petri Yana path. Right? This in the Varapurana says, Archir Adi Gatim Bina. Without that path of the dark and light of the Jnani Yogis and the Karma Yogis, it's described there. That is called the arch, the archier, path of Archie. That was Pitriyana and Devayana paths, described as the paths of darkness and in light. The, the ones who go in darkness, they return, because they go to the moon and they come back. And then the ones in light, they go to the Brahma Jyoti. And they have to go through all these stations, through all these demigods. And the first place they go to is to Archi, which was described, I think, as the, as the path of light. Uh, I forget exactly the words which were used there. But that was what it was referring to. Okay. So... Now you can ask some questions. You don't have any questions? Okay, we can go to the next section. <laughs> okay. Chaitanya Charan, the Prashna Sagar. <laughs> well, they, they, as Bhaktivedanta Vidya Bhushan kind of... Uh, presented their mentality in the words, may there be good fortune for all. But they don't really, you know, you know, they're not really actively, you know, proselytizing to help people in such a way. I mean, you know, okay, if they come across somebody and they see the person needs some food or something, like that, and they may, they may do some kind act. It doesn't mean that, that they're just cruel people. But the devotee is engaged fully in trying to enlighten people and engage them, you know, practically on the path of bhakti, which will bring them to Krishna. But the jnanis generally, they don't do that. They may have some feelings like that. Sarvabhuta hite rataha. So they're engaged in the welfare of others, but not that not they're like fully engaged like we are. The, that's as far as I s saw in this and in my realization about this. 
that the, all living entities they may have some good feelings because they they feel that everyone is part of Brahman. Then we're you know I am he and you are he and we are all the same, right? We are all the same. So therefore they they do have some feeling of kinship for all the living entities. But and and even if they were to start preaching, they can't really engage people just to sit and do this kind of meditation because nobody can do it. <laughs> it's very rare that person can do such a thing. So more more or less, it seems that it's just a kind of kind sentiment based upon their philosophical realization that uh, everyone is Brahman. But the, what are they? What are they actually doing to help people to come? Well, by setting a good example that they are not engaged in sense gratification and that they're fixed on the high on the higher path, the people that come to them, they may help them if they feel they're sincere, but generally they don't. They don't make an, any endeavor to go out. To, and generally, even when people come to them, they just try to avoid them. So, but we've seen people who are doing bhajan, they may initiate one, two, or a handful of disciples, and those persons may become Gosyananis. Like Gorka Shodas Babaji, he didn't actively preach. And generally, he just avoided people. It seemed like he was deeply disappointed with the human race. <laughs> and even he turned away Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. But because he came back and again and again, and then he saw that. This person's actually r r for real. He's genuine sadhu, and if I don't initiate him, he's going to throw himself off the bridge, you know, and commit suicide. So then he uh, accepted him. But generally, they don't, like Lokanath Goswami also. He didn't want to accept disciple. But uh, Narutam Thakur was acting such a humble way, and he was the son of a rich man. A very high class person. So when he saw them doing that kind of seva, latrine seva, you know, so then he accepted him. Of course, Lokanath Goswami maybe was some kind of bhajananandi, but he was also sent to Vrindavan to establish the Gaudi religion, just as the Goswamis were. They, he was first one actually to arrive, but. Um, he wasn't as successful as the others. But, uh, <clears throat> I mean, how they express their compassion for others is maybe unseen by our eyes because they, simply by being on the earth, they're giving, you know, some benefit to the atmosphere because there's a soul that's completely absorbed in Leela Smarana. So it's subtle type of uh, benefit. Just like we, we're chanting here, but that also has an effect on the whole city of Pune and beyond. You know, so you can, si you can think of it like that also, that their compassion is, you know, not expressed overtly. But perhaps overtly to only to those who are qualified to actually be inspired by their example. Yeah, they can be doing that, yes. If they're praying. That's one way they could express it. No, it's not just going through the motions, but it means maybe they, you know, kind of somewhere in their heart they have some attraction for Krishna. They feel a little affection. You know, for a few moments they might have felt some affection hearing the pastimes of Krishna or worshipping the deity. I mean, like, you go to Vrindavan, you even see these Mayavadi sannyasis 
when they say Radhe Radhe, <laughs> you know, they don't say Om Om Namo Narayana or whatever. You know what I mean? They say Radhe Radhe. So you know, it's like you can see that you know there's some attraction to this to our path, even by them. So the the it's not just that okay they you know wave some incense in front of a Krishna Murti or you know but something they get a little bit affected by this maybe they brush it away as uh, this is just some sentiment but they <laughs> but they actually may feel something for Krishna and that that little bit of feeling that's how I understand it. it's not just some you know overt practice just going through the motions of some of the angas of bhakti but there's some attraction there that a little shraddha is there and that kind of gives them enough bhakti to go to up to brahma jyoti yeah he doesn't have enough bhakti but there may be some tinge there or some some attraction yeah. Yeah. They're kind of like the dancing here. Yeah. yeah, it's it's almost impossible not to be a little bit attracted to, it, isn't it? Cuz they they can't express any emotions, you know. And it's not you know, it's it's uh, uh, unnatural to be so dry. <laughs> yeah. Cuz the devote, you know, especially, you know, in Especially people in this country, or especially in Bengal, you know, isn't it? How can they be so dry and personal? So there has to be some attraction. Let him ask now. Well, the person is working. He's thinking of the person who he's working for. So he's thinking of Krishna. And uh, but later, when he's old and he can't do so much, then he sits and he ha he performs lila smaranam, because now all the modes of nature are gone, or almost gone, and his mind's peaceful. So then he can just sit and meditate. So that's you know that's like. Uh, the actual level of samadhi, like if you compare it to the Ashtanga yoga practice. The work itself is samadhi also because the person's thinking of the object of his worship while he's working. So it's equal to a, a yogi sitting down and meditating. Or you could say, in one sense, it's equal to someone doing nirjan bhajan and lila smaranam because they're both thinking of the Lord. So in that way it can be considered as samadhi. But the pr we'll see uh, when we get up to these verses that um, you know the person who cannot fix his mind so easily then he has to kind of practice pulling it back, pulling it back. And even the person who can't even do that, then he has to just engage in activities for Krishna. That's also considered bhakti yoga. And it can be pure bhakti yoga. But it's just that he's not on the same level as the persons that can just sit and remember the Lord. We'll, we'll get to this again. And you can think more about it. Yes. Well, it could be, because <laughs> the 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 mayavadis they have no tinge of bhakti. They're aparadis, so they don't get any result. They just take birth again and again in maya samsara. So, yeah, it would have to be that way. It cannot be but uh, but this way, because these 
the, the persons who are brahmavadis, they have a chance to become rectified, although it's difficult. But the mayavadis, they don't have any chance for them. They don't accept Krishna's form is eternal. That's, the, that's their aparat. But the brahmavadis accept that, okay, well, there's different kinds of brahmavadis. There's one kind that doesn't accept Krishna's form as eternal. And, and, and he may think, well, I need to do a little bhakti to get up to Brahma Jyoti, but I don't accept Krishna's form as eternal. So he's also an aparati. He doesn't go anywhere. He's also a mayavadi. And then there's a person who doesn't, I don't care about bhakti, and I don't accept Krishna's form as eternal. He's the super mayavadi, and he doesn't make it. So two kinds of mayavadis. One who th understands he needs to do a little bhakti, but he also doesn't accept Krishna's form as eternal. So therefore, he cannot enter. And then the other brahmavadi, the, the, the third level of impersonalist, is that he accepts he needs to do a little bhakti, and he accepts Krishna's form as eternal. But he's just not interested in serving that form, and he feels that the Brahman is a superior form. Just as the Narayan worshippers, they think that Narayan is superior to Krishna, so the Brahmavadis, they think Brahman is superior to Krishna, and Krishna is just a manifestation of Brahman. But they don't think that it's sattva gun. They think that it's actually spiritual, eternal. But it's just not for them. They're just not their cup of tea, so to speak. <laughs> huh? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And their father suggested they go to see Narayan. <laughs> there was a trick. <laughs> And they, anyway, that's a long leela. I can't get into that now. But they, they, you know, that aroma of the Tulsi mixed with the chandan on the lotus feet of Narayan, it, it just some, somehow entered into their nostrils. And then it, from their nostrils, it went down, you know, up in, well, through their mind into their heart, and it attacked the city of their heart, which is the capital city of the living entity, right? And when you attack Maharashtra, the first thing you'll go for is Bombay, right? So that you can take over Bombay, you can c conquer the whole of Maharashtra. So similarly, the, that aroma, it attacked their heart, and it this way conquered them. And then they began shivering and shaking, and, and uh, you know, exhibiting s the symptoms of ecstasy. Their body became discolored and tears started to come from their eyes and they began shivering and Lord Narayan was just twirling his lotus flower and he was looking at them why are you disturbed? I thought you were all fixed in Brahman <laughs> <laughs> so that way in that way you know bhakti entered their heart <laughs> a hellish offender. Mayavadi, Aparadi, <laughs> Mahaprabhu said. Mayavadi is an offender. Then just Avajananti Mamudha. They don't accept Krishna's form. That's envy. They don't think that it can be possible that Krishna is supreme. Must be Maya. That's why it's Maya. Sattva Gun. I think it's a manifestation of Sattva Gun. Okay. Yes. Later, when they try to switch over. But well, we said that when they try to come to Vasudev Sarvamiti, then it's hard for them to give up this Nirvishesh idea. But Baladeva Yabhushan said that. There are some people who think, or who express, that if, if a person worships or meditates and realizes his own self 
first, then the path of devotion will be easier. So he's talking about a kind of devotee, in a sense, but he's just who who feels that there should be some gyan there. And if that's how he uh, interprets these verses. Ramanujacharya says the akshara is the parabrahman, but other Vaishnav commentators have said agree with Baladeva and Dibhusha and they say it's the jiva, only the individual soul. Okay, um, it seems like we should stop now. And then maybe it's just as well because then we can just concentrate on the next section and then I have more time to meditate on all these things, mainly the last verse. <laughs> which is really a, a mind twister. <laughs> There's probably three or, f three or four ways to explain the last verse. And plus, I, the translations of the commentaries have, they're also a little different. Like I have the commentaries that I used for the Gita Mrita. Now I'm using some better ones. I, someone also did, uh, a friend of mine did the Baladeva Dibhushan's commentary of ch uh, chapter 12. So I have that also, and, and some other things which I'm trying to look at and trying to figure out, because even those are different, you know, slightly different. But one thing, before you go, I wanted to ask you. Uh, many devotees, before they became came to ISKCON or they surrendered to Prabhupada, uh, they had some conceptions of God and many times they were impersonal. So I wanted to hear what your conceptions were before you became a devotee. How did you think of God before? <laughs> what, what was your conception of God? Yes, please tell us. Into the sun. Uh, <laughs> you did that meditation? Yeah. <laughs> and what was your experience? What did you realize from that? <laughs> uh <-huh>. Okay. <laughs> Good. Somebody else? <laughs> yeah, Chaitanya Charan. You must have a, a, an interesting conception of God. <laughs> I mean, people were suffering stuff. <laughs> Even it didn't work for you. <laughs> but what was your conception of God? Uh, like uh, God the Father on the throne with long robes and some sort of father yeah all right. Christian idea huh? yeah. hmm. how about you Radisha Are you, you're a Vaishnava family huh? no I come from Shaivai family Ancha. but uh, we, we were living in a village you know? so we were like in the street not caring for their dust and mud out of love for the Lord. <laughs> you know, we can tell people that that have this impersonal idea that can you imagine Hanuman desiring to merge into Ram? No way, right? I think n there's no Indian that could imagine a Hanuman is going to want to merge into Ram. No, because he always wants to serve Ram. Isn't it? It's a good example. You can try to use that sometimes. Anyone else had some, any other interesting conceptions of God? Huh, more? I was actually not a serious person, but I want to say, but then another Babaji came, he told me to worship Shiva, he's a doctor. So I guess you thought that 
well, I'm not getting what I want from Ganesh and Venkatesh, so I might as well try some, somebody new. <laughs> right? Right. But they're quite happy to submit themselves and worship somebody, but they just, whoever comes around and tells them, they? right? It's like that. It's interesting for me because, you know, I, I, I don't know anything about <laughs> the way you, you know, the people in India, how they... My conception, well, I grew up as a Catholic, so I had this Christian idea, like Chaitanya Charan, that God is the Father, He's kind of old, and, uh, you know, very powerful, creator. The Christian idea is like that, that God is like an old man, the Father. That's why the people like uh, this, you know, Santa Claus and Christmas, because He's also an old man. Well, he's like a, one of the saints, you know. And and also he brings you whatever you want, <laughs> you know. That you know the order supplier idea, I guess, is carried over from Hinduism to uh, Christianity, right? It's the same idea. That's why they want to take shelter of God to fulfill their desires. In general, that's the approach. But when I was very young, maybe twelve or something. I was already suffering, you know, 13 years old, something like that. And I remember I made a, a vow to myself. I said, and, and I never read anything about philosophy, religion before. I was a young boy, maybe maybe even 10 years old, I forget. But I, I, I remember I made a vow to myself that if there is reincarnation, if there is such a kind of system like reincarnation, well, you have to t come back again and again, different births, then I want to never have to come back to this world again. Because I was already convinced. <laughs> this place is a very suffering place. <laughs> I was already suffering at that time. I wasn't sure if there was a re reincarnation or not, but I thought if, if there is such a thing, then I will never have to come back again. And when I joined the temple, it, this may even s kind of shock you. I remember uh, I was I'd come to the New York Temple. It was John Mastami actually, and there was a big feast festival going on. There was a feast down in the in the restaurant, so I was standing in line for the feast. And there was one hippie in front of me, and he turned to me, and we started talking. And he asked me, "Hey, do you believe that Krishna's God? Do you really believe that?" And I said, "Well, maybe." I mean, I believe that there's God. I believe in God, but I don't know if it's Krishna. But it's possible. And he said, yeah, okay, I'll buy that. <laughs> so it's like, I believe that there was a God, but I didn't know really who. I, and, I, and I understood that God was a person. Because I went through this with my friend, who was a bit of a philosopher, you know. And, the, and I, you know, him and I, we would, would have many talks. And he said that, he said that everything is personal. Actually, the devil is a person, God is a person, and everything has personality. And I, and I never heard that before. So for me, it was like he was kind of like my shiksha guru or something, you know. And I and I could understand that that was true. So I realized that God is a person. So he has to be one of these personalities, but I'm not really sure exactly, you know, who it is. Could be Krishna, like this. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, Western people they're even more confused. <laughs> but in India at least they have some idea that you know, the different deities. But there's so many deities that they become. But in West they have no no idea, actually. Just the Christian idea of God the Father or some impersonal understanding without any form. Generally that's the idea. There was one time I held a seminar, and one devotee, he said, he said, I used to think God was a woman, like a goddess, something like that. Did anyone, you have that idea? Goddess, there's a goddess, a female shakti, like this. The ultimate...